So last weekend, Pastor Bettina put an exclamation point on the unmistakable commission that Jesus puts on every one of our lives as a follower of him. Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, often called the Great Commission. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And so that is what First Methodist Church of Oviedo is going to use as our measuring stick going forward. The question that we're going to ask and put in front of ourselves all the time is, is what we are preparing to do, planning to do, is it going to help us to go and make disciples through the power of the Holy Spirit? How does this thing that we're considering doing help us to make disciples for Jesus Christ? And if it doesn't, a great question to ask is, then how can we turn it into something that can make disciples for Jesus Christ? I remember years ago at one of my former churches, one of our values as a church was that everything that we did have to have, had to have what we called a Jesus component. I don't even remember what the event was, but we were hosting something or participating in something, and one of the folks in our church got very upset, did not understand why we were participating in it, and made an appointment, came in to see me, and sat down, and she said, how is this something that has a Jesus component in it? Where is the Jesus component? And I said to her, you... You are the Jesus component. When we show up, Jesus is showing up. At least that's the plan. So, I don't know if you've noticed, but it's, it's kind of challenging to get to our church these days. There's a, there's a tiny bit of construction, a couple cones out on the main drag going through town. Uh, you know, I find it interesting that the... Uh, We've closed off an entire city street, but the Baptist church still has an entrance. <laughs> I, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I, I didn't just, you know, I didn't even just say that. Just forget that I said that. <laughs> anyway. But I came yesterday morning, and I'm, and I'm noticing there's all this traffic. Early in the morning, a little after 7, there's all this traffic. I'm like, Where, where's all this traffic? Then I remembered it was right here at our church. Because we host a couple times a year. We've hosted this run club, and they do a run, and they take off from right here on our property in front of the historic sanctuary. So there were about 300 runners and all sorts of other people. Certainly none of them were planning on anything that they were doing yesterday having a Jesus component. Well, they weren't counting on me. Now, in your bulletin... Is there an insert that looks like this for you? Everybody got one of those in your bulletin? Well, you know what's interesting is if you look at your bulletin inside, exactly the same information that's here is here. You say, well, why is our church wasting this paper? Well, this is for you. Take this home because this information is important for you to know. This is not for you. This is for the person that you are longing, hoping, praying will be sitting next to you at one of these things. This is your invitation. This is the Jesus component. So a whole bunch of people showed up here yesterday to run and they weren't counting on having any kind of Jesus encounter. Well, a whole lot of these got passed out yesterday. <laughs> I have no idea if there'll be any fruit there, but I had an awful lot of fun being that surprising Jesus component. We had a service here yesterday for somebody who was years ago connected to the church, beautiful family, Lost a loved one. Pastor Patina mentioned remembering the Berlin family in our prayers. And, and almost everyone that showed up, over 200 people for that service, 
I don't think there was one of them that was connected to this church when they came. But I can tell you because Terry Wales and Bob Sparrow and all the folks on our AV and, and just the way that they were welcomed and greeted and cared for, they felt more a part of our church when they left. That's the Jesus component. You see, we're not competing with other churches. We are so incredibly blessed as a, as a community to have all the great churches that we have here in Oviedo. There really are. There are some incredible churches and pastors and, and uh, staffs. We're not competing with them. Did you know that Oviedo is 70% unchurched? 70%. Please don't go and give this to one of your connected friends who has a relationship at another church. Give this to the person who's going to be sitting nowhere when these things are happening so that they might be sitting right here next to you. You see, that's our target. That's who Jesus is sending us after when he gives us the Great Commission. Because we can offer something to people that the world cannot. They can offer them love, some form, some fashion. They cannot offer them godly love. Because that only comes through godly people, through the power of the Holy Spirit. So let's look at what comes next for us. If we're going to be a church full of people seeking to obey Jesus' great commission, then what did that tell us we have to be like? Pastor Patina helped us to grasp that we need to, to turn in Jesus's, to Jesus' words for what we're called to do. Well, I want to tell you this morning that we're also called to turn to Jesus' words for who we're called to be. And so what I want to turn to, I want you to take a look at, is the context of the commandment that Jesus puts in front of us. We just read it a few moments ago, John did, from Matthew's gospel. There's no way for us to miss the importance of Jesus' desire that we love our neighbors as we love ourselves. In fact, verse 39, he just says it flat out. Love your neighbor as yourself. But to me, what Jesus says after the two things that are expected, those two expected answers after that comes something equally life-changing. Verse 36, we're told the Pharisee asked Jesus, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? The question is meant uh, for Jesus to stumble over, to trap Jesus. If Jesus picks only one, then it would imply that the other laws, all the other laws that the Torah had thrown at them, that those weren't great. At the very least, the hope was that that people would only catch part of the conversation or part of his answer. People would go away or walk by and go, well, that Jesus isn't who we thought he was. How often does that happen in the world today? But Jesus in this story, just as he does in all the others, never responds the way that they expect or hope. He not only leaves the Sadducees speechless, which happens before this, but now he's got the Pharisees and he's dealing with them by talking to them about something ancient. He says, you love Torah, don't you? You love all the laws. You love all the things that you say are a part of our life. He turns them, takes them back to Deuteronomy and to Leviticus. He says, if you love these things, then there's a way to live into these things. And he starts out by telling them, reminding them that loving God is non-negotiable. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. There's no surprise there. In fact, if those religious leaders had been asked the same questions they were asking of Jesus, they probably would answer the same way. The question was, which is the greatest commandment? Jesus says, well, this is the first and the greatest commandment. But he doesn't stop there. He says the greatest and most important thing we can do is to love God and to do that with our whole heart and our soul and our mind. 
He says, but you can't be a lover of God and not be a lover of your neighbor. And you cannot love your neighbor with godly love unless you have a love for God. He says it's not either or. It's both and. How many of you have ever had the opportunity to go at some time to the Orlando Union Rescue Mission, not just for the foot washing, but have served food there or seen the men there, been a part of that? Thank you guys for doing that. It is the... I think you will support me. It is one of the most hopeful, optimistic, upbeat places that you can be. It's really an incredible, incredible ministry. I I hope that uh, that, uh, you're going to make the decision to come be a part of that Good Friday foot washing uh, with us. It is is a a faith-transforming experience. Last year, Pastor Patina and myself and, and several of you went and participated in that foot washing, I was um, partnered up. They, they put us in stations, and I ended up partnered up with Cheryl and with Cameron, both who were at the last service. And what you would do is you, you take up your, your space at your station, and then folks would come from the meal that they've shared with them, and they come to your station, And immediately you begin to talk with the the person who's come to you and you take off their shoes and you take off their socks and you begin to to care for their feet. You see, they think we're having a soul interaction with them, S-O-L-E. But the reality is that everything that they do has set it up for us to have a soul, S-O-U-L, conversation. Now, Cheryl and Cameron were a lot better at the conversational part, so I ended up being the runner. I got to go get shoes and socks and bring them back. So one man in particular, when I got back, they were, they were all ready for the shoes and socks, so he immediately put them on, and he picks up all of his, his things. He had a, a huge number of possessions that he was carrying with him. And so I just kept walking with him because I, I, first I wasn't sure he was going to be able to carry it all, but, but he had it. And as we're walking, I said to him, um, how, was your, what, how was your food today? He said, it was a banquet, a feast. Now, I saw what they were serving. It was good food. They had a plate full. It was well-prepared But if somebody were to ask me what they had, I would not have said a banquet, a feast. Had a smile all all over his face. And so I I asked him a second question. I said, how many people, I was just trying to make conversation, how many people do you think got fed today? Well, I'd already talked to Freddie Clayton, the executive director. I I had a number in my head. (laughs) I wasn't prepared for his answer. He said, thousands, a multitude. Freddie's number was a little lower than that. I mean, it was impressive, but it was lower than that. So why have I told you that whole story? Well, I want you to understand that somehow in that man's mind, there is a group of people in this world who wanted to intersect with him for a moment in his life because they were so dedicated to loving God and loving people. And they did that in such a way that in that moment, he believed that miracles are not only possible, but that he was participating in one, that thousands of people, a multitude was being cared for. Church, I don't don't want to correct his math. What I want us to do as believers in Jesus is to live into the picture that's in that man's mind. That we become the ones who feed the multitude, who are part of the miracle. Church, that's our calling. How do I know that, that what I'm saying is true? Because that's what Jesus says. Verse 40, 
Everything depends on this. That's what Jesus tells us. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Boom, mic drop, that's it. Jesus tells the Pharisees, everything in the Torah, everything that you say you love, everything that you tell people you've built your life around in some way, shape, or form depends on living out these two commandments. To love God, which means you cannot fail to love people. It's an amazing statement. He doesn't just say it to the, the Old Testament religious legalists that have gathered around him. He says it to the church in the world today. You cannot love God without having that love reflect into the lives of people. And you cannot love people the way that God has called you if you don't love them. You see, what Jesus, in essence, tells us is that I have to, I have to, to long for, hope for, dream for, aspire to, all the things that I want for myself, I have to want them for my neighbor. I have to literally open myself up and wrap the skin of my life around their life. I want you, I want for you what I want for myself. It is truly a staggering ask of the human soul. Why do I say it's staggering? Because it pushes back against our human nature. My human nature is self-preservation, self-enhancement, self-advancement, self-esteem. In short, Brian James isn't capable of this kind of love. Neither are any of you, except for the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit, which makes this not only what God has asked us and called us to do, it makes us fully capable of living it out. Guys, it all hangs from, from here. What's remarkable to me isn't how Jesus answers the question with what they're expecting, but it's what he says after. He, he didn't even have to say this. The Pharisees didn't ask. Jesus goes beyond what's asked, and he says even more. He pushes them to see the centrality of these commandments to love God, and to love neighbor, it's not only first and foremost, it is absolute. Jesus wants us to be stunned at how important these two commandments are. He wants to stop us dead in our tracks. He wants us to spend more than just a passing moment on these scriptures. He wants us to spend more than this message on these scriptures. He wants us to spend more than a moment, more than a day. Jesus wants us to spend the rest of our lives as believers, living as if these things matter so much that the law and the prophets all depend on them. See, that's what First Church is going to do. That's what First Methodist Church of Oviedo is going to do. And it's not because there aren't other churches doing it. It's not we got to get out of the comparing business. We're just us. I want to show you an image that's up on the screen here. How many of you are signing up to walk across that bridge? Do we have any, have any adventurous people? All right, cool. Well, there's a reason I'm showing you that picture. Let me just tell you a little bit about it. This is the Capilano suspension bridge. It is in North Vancouver, British Columbia. Anybody in here ever gone across that bridge? Been in British Columbia? Okay. East, Easterlings have. All right. 
The Capilano Suspension Bridge is 450 feet long, and it is 230 feet in the air hanging over a canyon that in the bottom is full of, of rocks and rushing water. Now, before you think that I've gone from being a pastor to becoming a travel agent and a tour guide, there's a reason I'm showing you this picture, because I want you to watch what can happen to somebody crossing this bridge. Dennis, I want to take a picture. Dennis, just look this way. Will you look this way? Dennis, I want to take a picture. Hang on. Dennis, just look this way. Will you look this way? Did we lose it? Oh, there it is. Dennis, just look this way. Will you look this way? <laughs> Dennis, just look this way. Dennis, just look this way. Just look this way and wait. Okay, wait. Just wait. No. Just wait. What are you doing? So I want you to notice that his wife kept filming and that it ended up on the internet. God bless her. So in an engineering journal, that bridge is described as a simp simple suspension bridge. And what that means is it has no support beams that run underneath it. It is entirely supported by two steel cables. And those are held in place by only two anchors, one at each side of the canyon. And the anchors that hold this bridge in place that make it functional and safe and secure are sunk into 13 tons of concrete on each end. The measurements of the concrete slabs are 13 by 3 by 3. Those supports aren't going anywhere. They are rock solid. They will never move. They will be here long after my life and your life and for generations. But have you ever walked on a suspension bridge of any size? Every step is an adjustment. It swings and it sways and you've got to try to keep your balance and put one foot in front of the other. Friends, that's the life of faith that we're called to live. Because our lives, they swing and they sway and they toss and they turn and they are up and they are down. But we are anchored. We are anchored into something that never moves and doesn't change. Church, I want us to spend the next season of our life as a church taking God's word about love seriously. And that means that we don't assume that we already fully know what love is and how it's supposed to be acted out in every situation. And it means that we're not going to assume that we have perfected the art of loving and there's nothing else for us to learn. Jesus said that all of Scripture... Old Testament, New Testament, and everything in between hangs, human history hangs on two great purposes. That God be loved with the whole of our heart and that we love our neighbors with the same kind of love. And that's the truth. Would you pray with me, please? God, we thank you for all that we are. We thank you for everything that you've created us to be. We thank you for the plans that you have woven into the creation of the world. God, we ask that you would help us. Help us beyond our own human ability. Help us with the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit to live into all that you've called us to be. As individuals, as a church family. And all this we pray in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, who is our Savior and our Lord. 
Amen.